Hi all, welcome to CSEC Biology with Mr. Charles. Today we are looking at grouping living organisms. Our learning objectives are as follows. Outline the characteristics of living organisms. List six visual characteristics that may be used to group living organisms. Apart from visual characteristics, state different approaches science, scientists may use to classify those living organisms. And finally, list the members of the five kingdom classification system, outlining the characteristics of each. Now, living organisms look different from each other because the, the range in size, for example, from microscopic or very small single-celled or unicellular bacteria to giant trees or gigantic whales. Okay, however, all living organisms share some common characteristics. They, there are eight of those characteristics. So we have movement, respiration, sensitivity, Sensitivity is also called irritability. We, we have growth, reproduction, excretion, evolution, and nutrition. Okay, notice I have identified the first letters, the first letter of each of those characteristics. That's because I have used them to create a mnemonic um, named Mrs. Green that would help you remember those characteristics easily. Okay, so M for movement, R for respiration, S for sensitivity, G for growth, R for production, E for excretion, the, the other E for evolution, and N for nutrition. Okay. Let's look at movement. Movement is a change in the position of a whole organism or part of an organism. Now, most animals are able to move their whole bodies from one place to the next. However, plants and some animals, okay, some animals are unable to move the entire body. They can only move parts of their bodies, okay? But on the side here, to the right of the screen, we have uh, four bacterial cells. And if you notice those long thread-like extensions from the membranes, these are called flagella. And those flagella allow the bacteria to move from one place to the next, okay? So not only animals are able to move from one place to the next, but we have bacteria and so forth that are capable of doing that. Then we have respiration, which is a process by which energy is metabolized from food in all living cells. There are two types of respiration. You have aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration occurs in the presence of oxygen in most cells and anaerobic respiration occurs without the presence of oxygen. Okay, good. Then we have irritability, which is the ability an organism has to detect or notice and respond to changes in its environment or within themselves, because the changes doesn't always have to happen outside of the organism. It can happen inside the organism also. For example, changing light intensity on the outside, touching a hot object on the outside, changing body temperature on the inside okay that's also part of irritability then we have growth which is a permanent increase in the size or complexity of an organism the key word here is permanent okay so if the organism gets larger it must remain large okay there must be no fluctuation in the size of the organism if it has to be growth, then it has to be a permanent increase in size of the organism, okay? Then we have reproduction, which is a process by which living organisms multiply themselves. So they generate, they generate new organisms of the same kind as themselves, okay? We have asexual reproduction, which requires only one parent. 
we also have sexual reproduction which requires two parents okay then we have excretion which is a process by which waste and the harmful substances produced by the body's metabolism okay it must be produced by the body's metabolism okay those harmful waste substances are removed from the body during excretion if they are not produced by the body's metabolic processes then it is not excretion for example feces the the passing of feces is not excretion because the the materials from which the feces are made was never part of the body's metabolism okay good evolution there is a huge misconception on evolution evolution is actually the change in the characteristics of a species so you're not talking about one organism but you're talking about a species okay more than one organism okay and as we go along you would see what is the definition or the meaning of a species so it's it it occurs at a population level okay it's a change in the characteristics of a species over several generations okay so it takes eons of years to see the evidence of evolution in larger organisms and in 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 microorganisms like bacteria okay that it, it, sometimes it's 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 seen in very short time spans okay so for instance persons who use antibiotics a lot over time the the bacteria would evolve to survive in the presence of the antibiotics okay so that's micro evolution there okay so one organism is more suited to live in an environment than the others so it survived for a longer period of time and because it survived for a longer period of time it's able to reproduce better and passed on its its favorable characteristics to the next generation right or its offspring and that's what evolution is all about we have finally we have nutrition okay or feeding which is a process by which living organisms obtain or make their own food okay some organisms have to rely on other organisms for food okay uh, and some organisms are able to make their own food so for instance animals they take in ready-made food okay from plants and and other animals in some cases and and they are called heterotrophs okay plants on the other hand are able to make their own food and they are called autotrophs so you have heterotrophs heterotrophs and autotrophs know the difference okay heterotrophs rely on other organisms to provide a ready-made food for them okay autotrophs are able to produce their own food okay mostly through the process of photosynthesis so for example plants are autotrophs okay now scientists tend to look for ways in which they can group organisms or in which they can classify organisms and when they want to group organisms the one of the ways that they do that is by looking at the organism's visible characteristics or what the organism looks like on the outside okay now when they are doing that they look at different characteristics for example the shape of the organism the color of the organism the size okay the uh, the number of wings that the organism has number of limbs or legs okay i should put legs in bracket here okay these are these are visible characteristics that they tend to look at and they also consider whether the body surface of that organism is smooth or rough okay is it smooth or rough okay is the body surface hairy or does it have scales okay etc physical external appearances 
However, those visible characteristics are not sufficient to determine the, the, the most accurate grouping in which an organism should be placed. Okay, so sometimes they need to use a combination of factors in order to accurately place organisms into groups. So they tend to use um, internal structural characteristics, okay? The developmental patterns, for example, how the, the organism develop over time, how the organism develop during, um, if it's an animal during gestation, right? During the period of time when the offspring is in the, is in the womb of the mother or in the egg of the of the bird as the case may be developmental patterns okay development before birth and after birth okay or before hatching and after hatching okay so all these are important in determining which particular group an organism belongs to they also look at the life cycle of the organism they also use microscopic techniques okay so for example an electron microscope may be used to classify organisms and they use the electron microscope to look at the shape okay the of the the microscopic structures that the organism have so structures that they may not be able to see with the naked eyes okay they would be able to see it under a microscope so they with the microscope they would be able to look at microscopic structures okay microscopic structures and that's especially important for microorganisms like bacteria and some fungi and so forth okay if they have to accurately classify them okay and algae because to the naked eye all bacteria tend to look the same but when you look at them under a microscope then you start to see subtle differences from organism to organism from species to species okay microscopic differences among organisms okay microscopic differences okay in addition modern or uh, Recent classification techniques uses the molecular structure of DNA, right? DNA is the, is the genetic material of organisms, okay? Or the, the material of inheritance. That is what is passed on from one generation to the next, okay? So when, when your mom and dad come together to, to conceive you, they gave you part of the dna okay or the deoxyribonucleic acid okay it's the blueprint okay that they passed on from generation to generation later on in the biology biology course we will come into actually how this this process occurs okay so the molecular structure of dna can be used to assist in grouping organisms accurately okay and how it works is that it's called comparative genomics okay let me write it here comparative okay comparative genomics and how it works is that the greater the similarity in the dna structure of two organisms the more closely they are related to each other okay the more closely they are related to each other and and this is a very important technique uh, a, a very important technique in determining the most appropriate class of organisms that a particular living organism should be placed in okay good now let's look at different species and the classification of organisms so we've been talking about species what's exactly as what exact what exactly 
is a species or our species. Now, before I say anything else on species, I would like you to know that the singular form of the word species is still species, okay? So species is both singular and plural, and I'll write it here, both singular and plural. So there is no such thing as a species, okay? There is no such thing as a species. A lot of persons tend to, to make that mistake, okay? So if they're talking about one singular, if they're talking about one, they would say one species and a species, and, and, and that's not accurate, okay? So one species, two species, okay? Both of them... Okay, it's, it's both singular and plural. Both singular and plural. Plural. All right, so what actually is a species? A species is a group of organisms. So it's not just one organism, it's more than one. It's a group of organisms that has a common ancestor, okay? or uh, some organism in the past that they are related to, okay? They, they closely resemble that organism, okay? And, and though the organisms within a particular species, okay, usually are capable of interbreeding, or mating, or copulating, okay? Mating, Interbreeding is the same as mating, okay? Mating, uh, copulating, okay? The writing is just taking some time, copulating. And when they mate or they copulate, they, if they are of the same species, then they must produce not only offsprings, but offsprings that are fertile, okay? Or offspring that are capable of making other offsprings, uh, continuing the, the lineage, okay? So for instance, for instance, a horse and a donkey would give birth to a mule, okay? However, a mule is not able to bring forth offspring. So that's, so because of that, the mule and the, the, the horse and the donkey are of two different species. That's why the, the offspring are, are infertile. There is also a situation where a lion and a tiger can give birth to, so I, I'll write it here. Hold on, let me get a different ink. Okay, so a lion, okay, when it meets with a tiger, there are two possibilities. Okay, you would either get a liger. You would either get a liger, okay, or a tigron, okay, a liger or a tigron, and it depends on on which of the parents it, the offspring comes out looking more like. So if the offspring comes out looking more like the lion then it's called a liger. If it comes out looking more like the tiger, then it's called a tiger. But they are not fertile, okay? So for two organisms to belong to the same species, they must be able to mate with each other to produce fertile offspring. So there are different barriers when it comes to producing offsprings and fertile offsprings among 
members of different species. So it's either a physical barrier where one organism might be too tall, okay, for example, a dog and a cat, okay, there is a great high difference, but there, so there isn't access to the reproductive organ. So sexual intercourse cannot occur. Okay, so that's a barrier to reproduction. Another barrier could be a chemical barrier in that they are able to have sexual intercourse or they are able to copulate or they are able to meet, but the sperm is not able to penetrate the egg. And even if the sperm is able to penetrate the egg and fertilization occur and all that, the, the offspring is born, but it's not fertile, okay? So, again, organisms of the same species, they share the same ancestry or they have a common ancestor, okay? Or a recent common ancestor, I should say, okay? Um, because there is a, a theory that says that we all come from the same universal common ancestor, but in order for two organisms to be, belong to the same species, there must be a recent common ancestor, right, that both of them are related to, okay? They normally resemble each other or they look alike, and they are capable of interbreeding or mating to produce fertile offspring, the offspring ca that can reproduce. Now, closely related species, when grouped together, you get a, a genus, one genus, okay? The singular form is genus, the plural form is genera. Okay, let me get a different color ink. So singular is, is genus, plural is genera. So more than one species would give you a genus. And when more than one genus, more than one genera comes together, you get a family, okay? You get a family. And when you have more than one families, okay, they would come together to get, to give you an order, okay? So they belong to a particular order. And more than one orders would give you a class, then the classes would come together to give you a phylum, okay? The plural of phylum is phyla, okay, phyla. And then the, the phyla would come together to give you the kingdom, okay? And then the kingdom would come together to give you what is called the domain, okay? So what we are going to look at now is the five kingdom classification system. Okay, the five kingdom classification system. There are five kingdoms in the modern classification system. We have kingdom Monera. Okay, I need a different color. You have kingdom Monera. Okay. You have kingdom Plantae. Right. You have kingdom Protactista. Okay, or the Protist kingdom. You have kingdom Animalia, or the animal kingdom, and you have kingdom Fungi, okay, or the, or the Fungi kingdom. Good. Now, members of kingdom Prokaryote, I want you to remember that word, Prokaryote, okay? Monera, every organism in this kingdom here, are what you call prokaryotes, okay? So kingdom Monera is also called kingdom prokaryote, but prokaryote is also a domain, okay? Now, the, the Monera kingdom, they have cells that lack a true membrane bound nuclei. So you may have a cell like this, and they have no membrane bound nuclei so the dna is just loose inside the cell okay there is no separation between the the dna and the cytoplasm of the cell okay 
so the DNA is free in the cell. However, members of the other four kingdoms, so members of the other four kingdoms, like plantae, protease, animalia, fungi, all these are eukaryotes, okay? Eukaryotes, okay? And they are called eukaryotes because they have a true nuclei surrounded by membranes. So these now, their cell would look, generally speaking, because they would all look different, but the cells would look something like this. So this is the nucleus inside here, okay? This is the nucleus, all right? And the DNA would be located inside of the nucleus, okay? The DNA would be inside of here, okay? So, but kingdom, Monera, or prokaryote, do not have these mem membrane-bound nuclei, okay? But it is important that you note that prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and archaea belong to the three domain classification system. And archaea, these are what you call extremophiles. Okay, they are extremophiles. They can live in very harsh environments. For example, like hot springs and sulfur springs and right saline ponds and and so forth saline means salty oh i'm spelling it wrong it's extremophiles okay they are called extremophiles extremo as in extreme right and files meaning to love so extremophile mean that they love extreme environments so is it an extremely high temperature or extremely low ph or extremely high salt content or high salinity okay salinity has to do with the concentration of salt or the amount of salt in a particular environment okay so they are extremophiles right some of those Organisms tend to live around volcanoes as well, especially underwater volcanoes. Okay, they are called archaea, or uh, sometimes they are called archae bacteria. Okay, archae. Okay, bacteria. Because it's a special type of bacteria. Okay, it's a special kind. Of bacteria, special kind of bacteria. Good. So let's look at Kingdom Monera. Those organisms in this kingdom, they are simple and they are made of one cell. That's why we say they are single celled. They absorb their food from the environment, so they digest their food on the outside and they absorb the end product of digestion. The tuberculosis bacteria is actual bacterium belongs to this kingdom. Okay, so on the right here we have pictures of organisms or diagrams of organisms that belong to Kingdom Monera, mainly bacteria. We also have Kingdom Protactista. Okay, Kingdom Protactista is also called the Protist Kingdom. Okay, protist, okay, protist kingdom, okay. So the organism in the kingdom protactista are called protists. They are collectively called protists. So the organisms are, are not called protactista. They are called protists. Okay, just as the organisms in Kingdom Monera are not called Monera, they are called bacteria. Okay, the organisms in Kingdom Plantae are not called Plantae, they are called plants. Those in Kingdom Animalia are called animals. Those in Kingdom Fungi, well, they are called Fungi. Okay, Fungi, plural, 
fungus singular. Okay, so Kingdom Pro Protoctista, we have a few examples on the right of the screen here. Okay, um, you don't have to know, go in depth to them, but if you are so interested, you could research and find out what their characteristics are. But most of the protists are single celled or they have one cell, but some of them are multicellular, which means that they have more than one cells. Okay. They can absorb the food, okay, after digesting them on the outside, as well as they can ingest the food, okay, or they can consume the food, right, and digest them on the inside. Some of them are capable of carrying out photosynthesis, okay, some of them are, so they have a range of nutrition or feeding mechanisms. An amoeba is an example of a protist. It is unicellular, okay, or it's one cell. The sea bamboo, on the other hand, is multicellular. It's a multicellular protist, okay? And as I stated, multicellular means more than one cells. Good. Then we have the kingdom fungi. Fungi, most of them are multicellular, okay? Uh, however, there are a few of them that are single-celled. Okay, they are also able to absorb the food after digesting them on the outside. Yeast is an example of a single cellular fun fungus. Remember I said singular is fungus, plural is fungi. Okay, so fungi is the plural form. And you don't say fungi, it's fungi. Okay, fungus and fungi. So fungi is plural, fungus is singular, okay? So yeast, the same yeast you use to bake bread, okay, that's an example of a fungus. It's a single cellular or single celled fungus, okay? Mushrooms, mushrooms that you buy in the supermarket um, and, and cook, they are also fun belong belonging to the kingdom fungi and they are multicellular fungi okay so mushrooms are multicellular fungi yeast are single cellular fungus okay so here on the left on the right here we have a diagram of a of a mushroom okay notice this is a cup of the mushroom you have the gills you have the spores that's how that's how they they release that's how they release the the um reprodu the the reproductive material so they would send off the spores and the spores would go off and land in areas where other fungi would grow okay this is a stock you have the hyphae here you also have hyphae on the ground you don't need to know all that. You just need to know what a mushroom look like, looks like. Okay. Now, uh, a warning: please be careful with fungi because the spores are very. Some of most of the spores are very dangerous to our health. That's why I said when you are when you are dealing with fungi, it's advisable that you use a glove, and that you use a mask over your no nostril. Okay, that's why you should not breathe over molded bread. Okay, because when the, the mold, when the 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 um, fungi is reproducing, it releases pores that are dangerous to your health. Okay, now kingdom plant. We are all familiar with the plant kingdom. Okay, are the kingdom of plants. They are multicellular, of course. Okay, and they have specialized cells to carry out specialized functions or specific functions. And they are, they produce food by the process of photosynthesis. Some plants, however, are carnivorous plants. Okay, some of you may have heard about them. Some of you may not have heard about them, but there is, what you call carnivorous plants. 
One of them, an example is the Venus flytrap. Okay. The Venus flytrap is a carnivorous plant. It feeds on insects. So its leaves are modified in that they contain a lot of sensitive cells that can detect touch very easily. So they are hypersensitive to touch. Okay, example, Venus flytrap. So when a fly or a small insect lands on the leaf, the leaf would close and engulf or surround the insect. Okay, and when the insect is surrounded, the Venus flytrap would secrete enzymes or digestive chemicals or juices onto the insect inside of the leaf, inside the inner surface of the leaf, and digest the, the insect outside of the leaf and absorb the end product of digestion afterwards. Okay, so some plants are like that. Okay, so this is the Venus flytrap. Okay, there is also what you call the trumpet plant. The trumpet plant have a big trumpet-like structure uh, with a flap over it. Okay, I'll write it down here, the trumpet plant. So not all plants rely uh, on autotrophic nutrition. There are some plants that rely on, on heterotrophic nutrition because they are carnivores. Okay. And that's because they live in nitrogen deficient soil. Okay, trumpet plant. Okay, inside the trumpet, there is water mixed with digestive enzymes and juices. So if a frog, for instance, lands inside of there, then it would digest the frog slowly and, and absorb the end product of digestion. Okay, but most plants majority of plants produce food by photosynthesis okay they use energy from sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen good then we have kingdom animalia okay kingdom animalia which is the last kingdom we look look at today on the last slide for the day okay or the animal kingdom they are also multicellular with specialized cells okay and they ingest the food or they eat the food. And I chose this image on the side here willfully because most persons do not consider things like prawn or crayfish, okay, and cockroaches and, and scorpions, housefly, all those things are animals, okay? All those things are, all those organisms are animals, okay? So next time be aware of that, okay? So that, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I hope this presentation has been beneficial to you.